All right, folks, here we are in my area. We've got a open press hanging out. We've got an amazing Spider-Man 300 and we've got a humidity box. So let's go ahead and start this on up. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and turn this on full blast. Then I'm gonna grab my amazing Spider-Man 300 here. Again, I tend to handle these, you know, an inch or two in from the edge with the book centered. And one of the things that I think is the most important here is I'm gonna have a nice open splayed hand while I'm manipulating this book. And so I'm gonna try to have those pages rest on my fingers and the back cover across, not just my thumb, but that whole palm of my hand over on, on the right side there. Okay, and so my left hand is plenty open up underneath. And I'm just gonna go ahead and flip to the center fold of this book. There we are, so there's our center staples. Um, and now I'm gonna support this with my right hand as I flip it on over here, going into my humidity box and just loop it very carefully. And again, I'm not going to disrupt um, those pages or, or, or the, the spine here. So I wanna make sure that that's supported. And so we're gonna go ahead and give that uh, its due, um, hanging on out in there as that thing builds up humidity. And so, um, yeah, while that's building up its steam and getting going and doing our hydration, what we're going to do here is take a look at my press. And so here is the press. It's a pretty standard um, Tussie. So this is right off the Captain Mike um, board. Now the Tussies sometimes say Tussie on them. Sometimes they don't. I've bought, I think, four of them total. And they all pretty much look exactly the same, except Tussie is sometimes written on them and it's sometimes not written on them, as is the case with this one. Now, people ask me, you know, what kind of press should you get? This is the clamshell style, open and close. Um, the seal variety is the much more expensive kind. Um, I don't have a seal. For the cost of a seal, which is typically a couple thousand bucks, you can buy like five or 10 of these. Uh, and so at least for the scale of the operation I do this at, I'm perfectly comfortable getting uh, just the clamshell. Now, some of the ones that swivel where the top plate moves over and then clamps down, um, I don't like that variety because it has uh, too many degrees of freedom. So there's too many ways for you to torque a book or cause a problem. The nice thing about the clamshell is it's open and close. There's no horizontal movement in any of the other goofy directions. Um, and so open and close, I think, is your way to go. Now, because it's open and close, it's hard to get those to shut this way. And I think one piece and one reason people hate on these clamshell presses and the tussies is because they don't have them calibrated right. Um, and so before I, I use the new press, you know, I pay attention to make sure that these plates actually shut nice and flat. Um, and to do that, what you have to do is pop this bolt out and slide some washers in here. So this is no longer flat. If you come on over here and look, it's lifted up on the back and that's to adjust the angle at which this thing shuts. Now, if you want instructions on how to do this, you should reach out to Chris Trump on the Captain Mike Facebook board. He has a fantastic FAQ and a how-to. So that is gonna be my advice there. But after I adjusted these back bolts on these Tussies, I've been able to get really flat books and I don't really see myself upgrading to a seal anytime soon because I don't really see the need. So at least based on before and after pictures and the grades I get back from CGC, I don't see any reason to upgrade uh, from, from the clamshell. Now inside my press, I have the silicone pad. This came with the press from the manufacturer. <laughs> You can remove this if you want. You just have to then crank on the knob to, to get it to adjust down. Um, I find it easier to manipulate with it. Um, I have in this press aluminum plates. I know that there are some people in the field who swear you need aluminum plates instead of steel plates because they have a different coefficient of thermal conductivity. Um, but uh, I actually think that's nonsense. So there are a lot of physical parameters one can use when defining a metal. The, the coefficient of thermal conductivity is like if you're going across a very long distance on a metal. And realistically, because this is the, the part of the press here that gets really hot, and this is the part of the press that's gonna have that aluminum plate sitting on there. Your surface to surface area contact is going to be extra large. And so I don't really think that there is a reason why you need um, a different metal. I've consulted a whole bunch of engineers that work about it, and they all agree if your surface area of contact is large, which is the case here relative to the thickness of the metal, which it certainly is, it doesn't really make a big difference. Okay, so sitting on top of that, I have two um, treasury backing boards. Um, and then I have my SRP paper ready to go. Um, and so this is the setup. I actually like the treasury side backer boards better than the um, 
magazine size because they give me a little bit more flexibility in the x and the y direction all right we're going to go ahead and kick this on typically i like to start that but i forgot to flip that on a minute ago and we're at about four minutes here for our amazing spider-man so we're going to go ahead and take this on out the first thing i'm going to do here is shut this off so that's two clicks on this particular model. And then I'm gonna slide my fingers under here so that I can pull up and hold the center page so I don't have to keep flipping. And then my left hand, I'm gonna grab it about two inches down on that spine. Um, and again, as long as the book is balanced, you're not gonna cause any spine ticks. So if you grab it from the top edge or the bottom edge, you're gonna risk that. But if the book is um, grabbed in the middle, it should be evenly weighted and you shouldn't really have a whole lot of problems. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull it out there we go, and now I'm gonna display my left hand and open it up and I'm right at the center fold. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my magazine backer board, which is hanging out right here, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the center fold. And as I do that, then what I'm gonna do is fold this on over using my right hand, and I'm gonna gently push on the backer board with my right palm um, against the staples. And so if you look right there very carefully, you can see a little bit of staple protrusion. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the bottom. And that's to make sure I get that backer board all the way in there and fully support those staples. And then I'm gonna open this flap on up, take my cardstock and slide it on in nice and snug. And I can feel that touch where my left hand is. Uh, and then again, I'm gonna close it, always manipulating it here in the center of the book, flip it on over, equally supported. Uh, and then I'm gonna put it on right there. Okay, now I have my nice sandwich. This thing now is stuffed uh, equivalent to a Thanksgiving turkey. And you can put it down on the top side or the bottom side. But what I try to do is move my hands over to the corners and, and then slide it on in there on the SRP paper. So that's kind of our look there pre-press. And you just wanna make sure everything is nice and snug in there. Um, this one will go ahead and press um, face down because that's the way it went in there. Um, you know, if you have a book with defects on one cover, you obviously want to start there. Um, but you don't, you don't have to always press it, you know, twice to do this. Most books, they only press once. So I'm just going to cover that SRP paper on up um, right there. I'm going to grab two other treasury backing boards, right like so. Grab my plate cover up the plate. And again, I'm putting some downward pressure with my hand, mostly just to make sure I don't have air in there so things don't shuffle too much. And then I'm just gonna shut this with a nice loving little click there. Um, and then this thing's gonna alarm at me and I'm just gonna click okay. Uh, and it should heat up to 155. So that's the temperature we're gonna do this. We did um, about three, th or sorry, about four minutes humidity, I think. Um, you know, it's hard here because I was talking, but it, it'll be close enough and good enough. And then uh, we have the 155 degrees. We're gonna do that for 15 minutes. Now, uh, I'm gonna make a confession here while we're standing here waiting for the, the press to go. And I won't run this for the full 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll run that, you know, off the camera here so you don't have to. But uh, I'm gonna make one confession and that is I actually reuse my stacking layers. So I know that that's sacrilegious to a lot of pressers who insist you should get fresh materials every time you press. Um, I experimented with that and I think you can reuse materials. So my personal um, method is I will reuse those materials uh, up for about a week. So typically on the weekend, I go through and clean everything up. And when I clean everything up, by the way, that includes wiping the tops of the presses. It includes wiping the table under the presses. It includes wiping this area. Um, and it includes cleaning out that box. And it also includes vacuuming both my area for cleaning as well as the floor here in my pressing room. So all of that cleaning is a Saturday thing. And uh, the reason I think I'm okay reusing materials uh, and I will put a caveat there. If you see anything gross stuck to your materials, you need new materials. If you see anything that's obviously a problem, you need new materials. So, But if you do a good job cleaning your books beforehand, I think you can um, reuse them. The most common thing I see on my books after a press is a little gooby. Typically, it's one single eraser shred um, that I didn't fully clean off. And if you watch the cleaning videos, you'll notice I end up with, you know, a thousand pieces of spent eraser after each one of these books. And so uh, probably in about one out of 50 books, uh, I'll notice a little gooby of eraser. And then that needs to go get um, gently removed, typically with a cotton round, and then often I'll repress those books. So, um, you know, that might be the penalty to pay. While I'm th talking about debris getting onto the books and into the presses, um, you know, what 
you do can make a really big difference. So one thing that uh, I noticed uh, one month in January is all of a sudden I was having hair lines and all my presses and I was getting hair in here. Um, and it took me a little bit to figure it out. But when I looked down, I had a nylon track jacket just fully covered in dog hair. Um, and so, you know, my pressing room and my cleaning room, I don't let my dogs in. They're, they're stuck somewhere else. And that's to keep the hair off of them. And then when I'm in the pressing room, usually I have a t-shirt on or some other cotton long sleeve shirt. I do not wear um, nylon. I don't wear anything that's a plastic artificial fiber because it just traps that, that dog hair. Um, I also point this out because I've seen pictures of people letting their cats lay on the nice warm press. And, you know, that's cute. I'm sure the cat loves it. But I'm also sure your risk of getting pet hair in your comic books goes way up when that happens. So, you know, just have to think those things through. Um, but at least with the materials I use, with those treasury backing boards, with the magazine backer boards, um, I'm comfortable using those for a few days. I know that's sacrilegious, uh, but it's the truth and I haven't seen it affect anything negatively as long as you're reasonable about it and look them over you know, before use, just if you have anything dark, if you have anything stuck to them, if they're horribly discolored, anything like that, they've got to go. But often if your books are clean going into the press, they should be clean coming out of the press. Um, all right, so we'll take a peek at this one here when it's done in a minute. All right, here we are 15 minutes later. We're just going to hit that button. And now we're going to wait a very boring 12 to 15 hours. All right, here we are. Now this book has been sitting in the press cold with the power turned off for about 15 hours. I did this one a little bit earlier in the day yesterday. Um, and so it's now early morning. Uh, typically I aim for at least uh, 10 hours and that's kind of my breaking point. But ideally I'll press uh, one batch of books between about 6.30 and 7 a.m. in the morning. And then I try to do another batch between about six and eight o'clock in the evening. And so that's kind of my window there that I try to use pretty regularly, about 12 hours apart, as close as I can get it to be as regular and to give the paper uh, time to settle and cool off in the press and let that heat kind of float through the comic. I know some people pop these after a couple of hours and transfer the book to a cold press. I don't do that. Every time I try to open up a book after a couple hours, I can see the cover start to start to flare out. And I think if you're seeing that cover flaring, one of the reasons for that might be that you're moving the book while it's too warm and it's having a, a cooling on the top surface as it exposes to air and as it cools, that curls up and the pages on the inside are still warm, which is why you get that curling up kind of motion. Um, and so let's just take a peek at this uh, Amazing Spider-Man 300. So I usually try to pop these as gentle as possible. And then I just kind of move my stacking materials over to be used uh, in the reverse order I put them down in. And then I try to reach in and typically I'll, I'll kind of support down by the spine and try to get my hand under there as quick as possible. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I try to slide these out with a minimal amount of friction because sometimes you get static and that static can sometimes be kind of lame. So, and then I'll just drop this down here on my mat and we'll see how I did. And as you can see there in the glare, it's a nice, smooth, amazing Spider-Man. It's pretty flat as we go down here. Um, and as you just look at that glare, it's got a nice smooth finish kind of all the way over the top. Uh, and that's it. That's how I press a modern book. So the trick here is hydration. Um, for modern books, I open them up with that kind of V and try to hydrate the exterior cover only. I think that really controls it. You know, I use metal plates, aluminum in this one, steel in that one, and I don't think it really makes a big difference. Uh, I like these treasury backer boards, so that's something I stumbled upon, and I'll confess, I reuse the stacking layers. Um, temperature will vary depending on your exact conditions. I've settled on 155 for books of this era for 15 minutes, and I'll point out, uh, you know, if I accidentally pull it out and it feels too wet from the hydration tank, I'll just let it go 20 minutes, and I don't see a problem with that. Um, it just helps dehydrate the paper a little bit more, and so if I'm worried that I overhydrated it, I'll give it a little bit more time in the hot press. What I do think is really important, though, is calibrating these clamshells. So again, I'll refer you to Chris Trump to be able to get that, that correct. And then the other thing is to make sure you leave it in there for at least, you know, like I said, 10 hour minimum, but I am for 12 hours. So that's it. Um, we'll go ahead and check out our Amazing Spider-Man number 300. 
newsy. It's even a newsstand. All right, if you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Um, I'll probably submit this one to CGC at some point, but I want to make sure I get this video out there for you beforehand. Um, and so, you know, stay tuned for that.